morning. I'm uh, Michael Sabia. I'm the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Uh, welcome and thank you for uh, joining this event uh, this morning, marking the publication of Reset, Ron Debert's new book and his accompanying Massey lecture. For, uh, for everyone who knows Ron and the importance of his work, uh, the honor of delivering the Massey lectures is uh, to put it very mildly, very well deserved. Uh, before moving on, I do want to acknowledge, as is our tradition, uh, that the University of Toronto operates on the traditional lands of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississauga of the Credit River, and we are grateful for the ability to do so. Um, if you'll permit me, uh, just a few quick comments um, with respect to Ron's new book, which I believe is not just an important book, I think it's a very important book. Um, it's important uh, because of its subject, the social, political, economic, and indeed the individual uh, consequences of the our broad communications environment, the internet, social media, the growing use of artificial intelligence. Um, uh, these issues are increasingly on the agenda and they need to be on the agenda of more and more governments across the world, um, hopefully for good uh, on those agendas, although that is not always the case. Uh, but certainly this book is very, very timely. I think this book is also important because of the undeniable rigor uh, with which it chronicles uh, the risks, the dangers, and the abuses that can flow out of the drive to monetize personal data that is so much at the heart of business models um, around social media and indeed more, more, more broadly and increasingly today, but also uh, the risks of all of this for the functioning of our political system, for our political traditions, um, significant issues there. So yes, undeniably, um, there is a dark side uh, to this story. And I must say it, that dark side is powerfully presented uh, in, Ron's, in Ron's new book. But I also think that there is an optimistic side to this. And that's my last reason why I think this book is important. Uh, because of Ron's commitment to work on solutions, to find solutions. Um, and that's a conversation that we all need to be having actually in this country, across countries and across the world. In Ron's hands, this issue about solutions, they cover a very wide range of ideas all under the banner of what Ron calls the principle of restraint. And for those of you who haven't read it yet, believe me, there's a lot of food for thought there. So Ron, uh, again, on behalf of all your colleagues at the school, congratulations. This is a truly remarkable piece of work. So to help us this morning dig into Ron's Thank thinking, you, I'm very pleased uh, to turn the conversation over to Zaya Tong, well known to many of you. Uh, Zaya is an award-winning journalist, the former a co-host of uh, the Discovery Channel's Daily Planet, and she's also most recently the author of a well-received book called The Reality Bubble, a book, and it's kind of linked to some of the conversation today, I think, a book that, that with the help of science helps us, encourages us to see through our blind spots and the illusions, many of the illusions that surround us. So Zaya, welcome, thank you for doing this, and over to you. Thank you so very much. And hello, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to the launch for Ron Diebert's terrific and frankly terrifying new book, Reset, Reclaiming the Internet for Civil Society, hosted kindly by the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Um, I'm going to be launching right in with a lot of my questions here. I'm thrilled to be here because I admire Ron's work so much as a thinker and an academic. Um, when we are having our conversation, of course, if questions come to mind, feel free to just put them right into the chat. You can see that right there. It's been built in. There's a Q&A feature. And I'm going to try to get to as many of the questions as I can um, during uh, the latter part of our conversation. 
But first of all, over to you, Ron. Uh, I want to say a huge congratulations on this book. The last time we saw each other in person, uh, coincidentally, we were seated next to each other on a flight to Vancouver when we were both working on our book. So this feels like a full circle moment for me. And this is how I'd sort of like to structure this conversation. Um, you take people to so many places around the globe because of course so many places around the world end up inside of our phones. So I wanna to travel to some of those hot spots, uh, not all of them because you cover so many. But first I wanna to get to a couple of general questions. And, and the first is really what sparked the idea for this book? There are many different books out there ever since Snowden came out with his revelations on, on surveillance. What gap did you think was missing that needed to be addressed? Oh, well, thank, thanks for that question, Zaya, and, and thank, thank you for doing this. And first of all, before I begin, I just need to give a shout out to Zaya for her book, The Reality Bubble, which is really awesome. Recommend it to everybody. Um, and, and is much more expansive than my book, but there is an overlap in, in, in important, important ways. So I highly recommend that. Um, you know, this the, the genesis for this book goes back a few years. Um, I, of course, as director of Citizen Lab, doing the research that I do uh, with all the amazing researchers in that in that uh, organization, you know, it's very meticulous, very evidence-based, you know, uh, almost clinical type of work. We're a, for those who don't know about the Citizen Lab, we're we're like a digital watchdog, and we see ourselves peeling back the layers of of the internet and the communications environment that surrounds us to um, uncover and bring to the public's attention abuse of power, whether it's governments or the private sector. And, um, you know, of course, uh, you know, having a, a lot of friends who are interested in these topics, I'd often get asked questions about social media, about Facebook, about mobile devices. And I would have a, a fun time, you know, just kind of getting in and trying to answer them. And um, so back in, I, I believe it was around 2017 or 18, I was in West Africa at a, at a conference and someone there um, heard me make some remarks about the painful truths of social media. And these were just offhand remarks that I was making at the time. Uh, I later developed them into an essay for the Journal of Democracy and then when uh, I got the great fortune to get the call from uh, the producers of ideas and the Massey lectures, extending an invitation, I thought, oh, well, this is something I'd, I'd really like to uh, dive deeper into. So um, that's kind of how it all came about. I really like writing in this manner. Um, as a scientific journalist, of course, you, you do this all the time very well for me. It's, uh, it's like being unplugged uh, for you know, a, a rare opportunity to just let go, tell some stories and, and write in a different, more accessible way, which I really enjoy. Yeah, it's definitely accessible. And that's what I love about it. It's very much story driven. Uh, now you just mentioned, of course, that Citizen Lab works on um, issues related to abuses of power. So this is the second question I wanna ask, which is just relevant to where we are today in the middle of a pandemic. Most people, when they think of surveillance, um, it's generally considered a bad thing. So I'm wondering from your perspective, is there such a thing as good surveillance? And if there is, what sort of checks do we need to have or what sort of policy decisions do you have in mind with respect to say some of the contact tracing apps that people are being asked to download? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up because it's often the case that I hear people say, um, you know, surveillance is either good or bad or you know, we, we need to uh, fight against surveillance. I kind of understand where they're coming from. Usually they mean something a bit more specific. Um, the fact of the matter is that there are all sorts of good forms of surveillance. Um, the Citizen Lab engages in surveillance of our own sort. Uh, we are obviously monitoring what's going on. We're watching, we're uh, gathering information and analyzing it. Um, there is surveillance that is going to be and already is essential for taking the pulse of the planet. Uh, all of the, you know, technologies that basically orbit uh, the Earth and watch from above and, and gather data from above will be critical to us managing the challenges we face going forward. And I'd even go further and say surveillance is inherent to, to the human species, perhaps many species 
uh, it's, it's something that's inherent. We need to observe the environment around us and that's built into us by design. The question is not surveillance or no, no surveillance. The question is, okay, given that we need to have some kind of surveillance, surveillance can be good, how should, how should it be uh, constructed? And most importantly, what should the architecture of political restraints look like to prevent those organizations or individuals who are undertaking surveillance from abusing the great power that comes from it. Um, so if you go back to the Earth remote uh, sensing satellites, I didn't talk a lot about this in the book, but for the longest period of time during the Cold War, um, both superpowers had extremely powerful surveillance technologies in near Earth orbital space that can resolve things on the ground down to the level of centimeters. But of course, this was all shrouded in secrecy and it wasn't available to the public. Now things have changed. Uh, we have access to imagery uh, on that uh, level from commercial providers, but it goes to show that you know how surveillance is architected is very important for security, for privacy and other uh, human rights. So let's dig right in then to this notion of, of opacity then, because I think that, you know, we all have this machinery that connects us to the hive mind, uh, but it is opaque to us, right? And that opacity sort of stretches beyond the phone itself to the software, to the infrastructure, to the people who work on it. I love the way your, your book breaks that down. So as we begin our journey, let's start right here in Toronto, because that's where you start your book, at the Pearson Airport. So you draw together the intersection between corporate and state surveillance there. Tell us about that. Well, this was uh, an anecdote about my experience with the Snowden disclosures. So in 2013, like most of the rest of the world, I was observing the news with, with you know great awe. And uh, for me, it had real special interest because my own uh, personal entree into this area of information technology and global security came through my uh, research into signals intelligence, the very practices that Snowden had uh, blew the whistle on. And so I was in Pearson Airport and got an email from a journalist from the CBC asking, um, would I be interested in looking at some material they received from Glenn Greenwald, the journalist formerly of The Intercept, uh, to whom Snowden entrusted a, a lot of the material uh, that he had taken from the NSA. And so, um, you know, the first thing I thought of was when he started to describe this program, it was actually about Canada's Signals Intelligence Agency gathering some kind of data. He, he described it as hacking into the free Wi-Fi in Pearson's lounge. And I just happened to be in that very lounge when I got that call. Um, and, you know, I kind of looked around and this literally did happen. I, I recall pausing for a minute and looking around the lounge and just imagining all of the data emanating from everybody's devices and laptops and, and, and imagining it as if only I could see it. Because of course we can't see it. It's something that's there, but it's not visible. Um, and and a yet- real it's a neo moment that you had there, Ron. A, a witch? <laughs> A real Neo in the Matrix moment. When it, you... it, yeah, totally. Uh, and, you know, I didn't take any hallucinogen, hallucinogen so I was a, completely straight. And, um, but, you know, I, I just kind of looked around and imagined this and it, it dawned on me, especially once I got into those disclosures and realized what they were about. It was not so much that the um, CSE, Canada's Signals Intelligence Agency, and its partners, the National Security Agency in the United States, had constructed this uh, surveillance apparatus of their own, so much as they had piggybacked on it, an already existing, deeply penetrating uh, world of commercial surveillance, primarily the social media and other internet applications that had already uh, built up a business model, which, which is now known thanks to Shoshana Zuboff as surveillance capitalism. So basically this enormous change in how we uh, not only communicate, but seek and receive information and, and the relationship between our personal lives and data, all of the sensors that surround us and embed themselves uh, 
around our daily lives had effectively turned ourselves inside out. And there's all this data circulating around um, that the agencies had been able to access in some manner or another. And um, that really struck me at the time that, you know, while the reporting was very much focused on government agencies and the abuse of power or apparent abuse of power as revealed in those programs, I thought, well, actually there's a deeper underlying issue here that has more to do with us and our relationship to these uh, technologies that we kind of take for granted. And of course you really uh, do an amazing job of, you know, we talked about colorful stories, but then truly being some very dark stories. And uh, you do touch upon various aspects of what goes into our phone, whether it's the child labor in the Congo, uh, the mining for cobalt and tantalum, or the suicidal workers at Foxconn uh, several years ago in Taiwan, people were jumping off of the buildings, or even if it's the content moderators who are working in social media in the Philippines who are suffering from PTSD from having to watch beheadings so that we have a clean internet and we don't have to. And then on the flip side, it's the people who are using the phones. And, you know, we have this illusion of it being, you know, people looking at Instagram dance moves. But of course, it's plenty dangerous for, you know, especially human rights defenders. So the, the, the next spot that I would like to go to is really Saudi Arabia, because you and your work was involved in a very high profile case uh, that linked Canada and Saudi Arabia uh, many people heard about the case, of course, of the murder journalist, Jamal Khashoggi. So can you tell us about the connection there? Sure. So one of the areas of research for the Citizen Lab for the last decade or so has been documenting cases of nation state espionage, digital espionage against civil society, broadly understood. So, you know, anyone who isn't in a government or private sector, journalists, lawyers, human rights activists, and so on, uh, what we have um, observed is, is there's a terrible abuse of these type of highly invasive surveillance technologies that are sold mostly by the private sector to uh, nation state intelligence agencies. There really are no controls around this market. Um, over the years, one of the, um, I would say, greatest successes of the Citizen Labs team has been to develop means and methods to effectively track the infrastructure of some of these spyware companies, one of which uh, happened to be Israeli-based uh, company called NSO Group. So in uh, 2018, uh, in the early summer, um, led by our targeted threats team that includes Bill Marzak, John Scott Railton, uh, we had a pretty good bead on uh, all of the infected devices in the world um, that have been hacked using NSO, NSO's flagship spyware, Pegasus. And also we could infer pretty, pretty clearly who their clients were, who were the government agencies that were purchasing so you were um, this spyware. were engineering all of this. Pardon me? You were reverse engineering all of this so that you could see this web of connections? More or less, yeah. I mean, there, there are a variety of tools involved and certainly we did get a hold of Pegasus at one point and did, you know, examine it very closely, get a sense of how it communicates, um, and then use a variety of network mapping techniques. So, you know, there are tools from computer science and engineering science that you can use to scan the internet. Uh, and I'm simplifying, of course, but basically we're able to see, you know, just as these companies can see our digital trails, we can see their digital trails. So, you know, we're watching them. And um, what we could, what we noticed was that one of their clients, Saudi Arabia, um, had a, 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 an espionage operation targeting a device they had managed to successfully hack a device in Canada. Um, that's all we could see. Uh, we could, well, we could see that, you know, it was in the Montreal kind of Quebec region. And so uh, Bill Marzak, one of our researchers, went to uh, Quebec and we had a short list of candidates that we suspected uh, might be the targets. And we went out and interviewed uh, the people uh, with their consent, looked through their devices. Uh, when we came across um, a person named Omar Abdulaziz, we discovered that he had indeed been targeted with the spyware. We, looked at his SMS messages and we could see that um, he had been targeted 
sometime in the summer. Um, his pattern of life, his movements also matched what we could observe in terms of this hack device checking in. So we had positive confirmation. Of course, this was all very uh, exciting and alarming because right uh, during that summer, this, this all was taking place while Canada and Saudi Arabia were in a major diplomatic dispute. Our foreign affairs minister, our prime minister, were both critical of Saudi Arabia's human rights record. They were responding with you know, all sorts of vitriol, including over social media. Um, so we published this report in the fall of 2018. And what I didn't know until um, the day after it was published, uh, which coincidentally was the day Jamal Khashoggi was murdered, was that Omar Abdulaziz and Jamal Khashoggi were very close confidants. They had been um, communicating over what they assumed were end-to-end -end encrypted uh, messaging applications, uh, which they thought would be secure, um, about plans to mobilize against the Saudi regime. And they were throwing insults about Mohammed bin Salman and so on. What they didn't realize, of course, was Omar's phone was hacked with this powerful spyware that enabled Saudi Arabia to effectively look over their shoulders, silently eavesdrop on everything that they were doing. And the content of those communications that the Saudi intelligence operatives were observing was inflammatory, right? It's the type of thing that in the context of Saudi Arabia is frankly considered treasonous. And it's quite likely that the surveillance we uncovered was instrumental in the decision to murder Jamal Khashoggi. Yeah, it's terrifying. And I, you know, I get goosebumps listening to you talk about it now, just as I did when I read about it in the book. Now, um, at Citizen Lab, you have what's called a sandbox where you do this testing. I'm assuming it doesn't involve actual sand, but what does it sort of entail? And can anybody bring you a phone? If somebody's really concerned, uh, how does that sort of work? Well, that, that's a really good question because um, recently there's a, a funny anecdote where Edward Snowden was on the Joe Rogan podcast. I don't, I don't listen to this podcast, but I know enough that it, I think it's the most popular podcast in the world am I mistaken yeah, apparently. That? I don't it's up there <laughs> okay so well we learned of it because while Snowden was a guest he he said hey you know this great organization Citizen Lab and you know Ron Debert has a book coming out uh, Citizen Lab does all this work protecting people against you know nation state spying if you receive something suspicious just forward it to them <laughs> while, while we were uh, very grateful for the shout out um we actually have very strict protocols at the university when it comes to dealing with any, uh, any, any person, any individual, which we, we treat effectively as human subjects in the same way that you know, clinical uh, research would be undertaken. We have ethical obligations uh, to those human subjects to protect their confidentiality. Uh, people, unfortunately, you know, cannot just walk off the street and, and we're not like a uh, you know, a, a service station for hacking. <laughs> um, uh, we, we do this in the same manner that, you know, uh, any other scientific research would be undertaken, which is under strict research ethics protocols. Um, those can be kind of burdensome, but actually they're really important because um, whenever you are dealing with someone's personal information, you know, you know when they're entrusting their phone to you as, as Omar did, you're potentially accessing a lot of highly revealing information. You don't want to put that individual at any further risk. So you must um, both you know, explain to the person that, that you're dealing with, here are the risks here. So you understand this is what we do to protect your confidentiality. And then on the back end, we have to be very careful about how we construct our, our laboratory, frankly. And it, you, know, you described a sandbox uh, I wouldn't say it's a sandbox per se. It's more like, you know, various platforms and systems that we use overlapping methods, techniques and skills um, that have been refined over the years by the extremely talented people that I have the, the fortune to work with at the Citizen Lab. I've met some of them and you do have a really, you know, terrific 
team with a lot of integrity, honestly, uh, all the people Thank that I, I have tremendous integrity. Um, so I want to talk now a little bit and I'm, I'm irked because we're almost running out of time for my chat. I, I still have oh. so many questions to squeeze in. We talked a little bit about taking apart these phones, but you actually went to India and this is where people physically dismantle phones. You know that a lot of my passion is environmental work, having worked with WWF. Um, what surprised you when you went there, when you learned about sort of the tail end of the life of a telephone? Yeah, actually, you know, as you mentioned, when, when we um, coincidentally bumped into each other on that flight, um, I was asking you about this very topic because I knew that you, you had an interest in it. And I was just beginning to, to gather data on it myself. And I, I went to India deliberately. Well, one of the reasons I went there uh, was to explore this topic. And, um, you know, it's in India, I think to me is um, a particularly poignant example of the ecological footprint around, uh, you know, the hypermedia environment that we live in. You have this um, exploding uh, digital universe, like, you know, mobile phones everywhere, low cost wireless plans, you know, a, a burgeoning population of users. A lot of people are obviously not connected, but it's one of the fastest grow, growing in the world. Um, but it's also a country that has enormous challenges around um, environment and climate change. I saw this in Delhi. The, the um, period of time in which I was visiting was one of the worst in terms of air quality. And, you know, um, coal-fired power plants are being either newly built or, or tapped into again. So um, it was kind of illustrative of all the, all the issues that I wanted to get into. Um, I, I lined up some interviews with um, people working in the environmental area because I was there thinking, you know, these are people that would probably be under risk of digital surveillance. But I also wanted to learn about the topics that they were exploring. And I was, um, I accompanied a, a journalist from Al Jazeera to a district called Silampur, which is one of the largest uh, recycling, electronic recycling districts in India. And it was incredible to see, um, you know, this is kind of like en the end of life of all of this equipment that we see here, um, highly organized, very specialized, very professionalized, not the image that I had in mind coming from Canada about what I would be seeing. Um, it, not a screw went to waste. Every, every component was taken apart to its bare essentials to be reused or sold. Unfortunately, it was also being done in highly toxic conditions as well. And there was a lot of disturbing child labor that was apparent to me. Um, but it, it, I think, you know, for me, this is again, getting at this, the opaque nature, the opacity of our entire communications environment we don't really notice the ecological footprint around our uses of information and communications technology. It's kind of invisi invisible because of the, the, the way we experience all of this. For example, right now, as we are speaking, we are um, implicating a vast physical infrastructure and massive uh, carbon emitting, energy sucking data farms to power this webinar. Um, so it's a bit of a dilemma for me actually to be doing these sorts of things, knowing in the background what's, uh, what, what the engine looks like that's driving all of this, which is frankly, as it stands right now, unsustainable, dysfunctional to the challenges of uh, climate change. I think, yeah, that's where our, our interests really parallel, because we're both very interested in revealing those blind spots, those Absolutely. things that are everywhere around us, uh, but that we can't see with the naked eye. Um, so I want to move now uh, quickly to, to, to us, in fact. Um, I, I, I think you may have seen that last week Celebrite was back in the news. Celebrite is, is an Israeli company. Um, they've used their technology to break into activists and journalists' phones, as well as, you know, people who are being caught by the police. In Indonesia, this caused a lot of concern because what they're doing is they're going in and breaking into grinder accounts uh, that's used by the gay and lesbian, uh, the LGBTQ community there. And of course, if you're caught, then you get lashings. Um, it's also been used in Venezuela, Belarus, Russia, over 26,000 times. Mm. But Israel's not alone. 
um, Canada has a, a strong involvement in exporting these sorts of technologies. I, I, I'm hoping you can just spend a few minutes to talk to us about Canada's involvement. And you've also called this a, a crisis, a proliferation crisis, where these countries in, in you know, advanced large arms exporting countries are developing these, these technologies and exporting them. So what can be done? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a topic that we think about a lot at the Citizen Lab because we see firsthand the ways in which, you know, the, this new uh, industrial sector, cyber security, um, intelligence, espionage, et cetera. There's so many startups, so many companies that are providing uh, tools and equipment and products and services to government operators that really they never before imagined. And and these are uh, extraordinarily invasive because they tap into a, a technological infrastructure that is already highly insecure, invasive by design, poorly regulated. And so not surprisingly, you see all of this abuse um, where governments that lack accountability, lack proper oversight mechanisms, countries like Saudi Arabia, for example, um, they will define crime and terrorism, which is typically how these products are marketed in such broad terms as to include uh, people like me or people like you or, you know, uh, investigative journalists and lawyers, um, certainly any opposition figures. So there really is a kind of wild west out there. Um, one way that this could be solved would be through government regulation. So what we would hope to see would be for countries like Canada and others where these technologies are uh, based and being developed and in some cases even actually promoted and encouraged and financially supported by uh, the Canadian authorities and, and other governments like them to exercise greater controls over to whom they're sold and under what conditions. Um, this is one, I think, viable path forward. Um, I think it would be pretty simple actually to, to uh, build a regulatory regime that uh, requires companies who operate in the sector to be more transparent about to whom they're selling and create human rights safeguards to prevent the type of abuse that we are seeing um, accumulating on a, on a daily basis. There are so many cases uh, that we um, see ourselves and our partners at Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, others see as well, that demonstrate there is a crisis of unregulated surveillance technologies in the hands of government agencies. So we need to encourage our governments to rein this in. And, and frankly, Canada should be leading the way here, especially, you know, my hope was after the Omar Abdulaziz case, you know, this is, hits close to home. Saudi Arabia is undertaking cyber espionage against a Canadian permanent resident. Somebody who came to this country to flee from oppression. And, and you know, we advertise ourselves as encouraging those type of people to come here and we will protect you. So if we allow this type of, uh, unlawful and very harmful surveillance to take place to somebody that we are supposed to be protecting, we are failing. And frankly, we could do better. Our government, uh, you know, I really want to challenge our government to recognize that this is a, an issue that conflicts with our core values as a country, and we should be out in front of it instead of just, you know, um, following or reacting to news as it comes out. I absolutely agree, um, without a doubt. And I don't know if we can post a link to a great white paper that your team just put out recently on NetSweeper and Sandvine, but I think that that would be terrific because you outlined the awesome. solutions um, there as well. I'm starting to see the questions come in. So I think I'm gonna have to ask, I'm gonna have to defer yes, my please. own questions as I should as a decent moderator. Um, so one of the questions that come in, has come in is what about countries like China that has its own online chat platform, WeChat? Is there a way we can look at an international convention on privacy of the individual? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very good question. I mean, what we see in, in China is pretty uh, disturbing um, because there you have, um, you know, really dynamic uh, information technology innovation happening. Like it is truly, you know, the large, world's largest internet population growing in leaps and bounds. The, the applications that have been um, invented and developed in, in China 
are now extremely popular in that country uh, and also being exported abroad. Um, the problem is that, um, you know, the regulatory regime in China is such that it's very much about controlling what, what people uh, can say in that country. And, and the way they do this, we have discovered, um, we have a research team at the Citizen Lab that's focused entirely on uh, China's social media applications. A lot of the controls are downloaded to the private sector. So the government, you know, doesn't necessarily direct in a fine grained manner what should be censored or what type of surveillance should take place. They leave it to the companies. And as a consequence, it's very messy, um, you know, disorganized, but still quite effective, perhaps even more so if it was all centralized. Um, in China, of course, you don't have anything remotely like the type of safeguards you'd want to see to prevent the abuse of power around that data collection. So uh, there's a cybersecurity law in China that um, makes it mandatory for those companies to abide by a government request for user data. So if a security agency goes to Tencent and says, we want this data, they have to turn it over if they want to have an operating license in, in China. Um, that makes it very challenging to think about, well, how would we ever get agreement from Chinese authorities for something like uh, the questioner was asking, global privacy protections. I think right now it is pretty unrealistic. Um, it's also unrealistic because frankly, most of the, the liberal industrialized countries don't have very good privacy protections as it stands right now. It's, a, it's like a patchwork uh, quilt and uh, mostly ineffective in important ways. So that's why I think, okay, acknowledging that, you know, fixing the problem in China is very daunting. We just can't resign and do nothing. So that's why I think we need to start at home. We need to work uh, closest to home, really at the municipal level is where I think we should start, begin to build in these mechanisms of restraint, safeguards that I talk about for both the private sector and governments, and then hope that other countries do the same at a local level. And together we can start building up uh, safeguards and, and frankly hope to persuade people inside those countries where controls are more difficult of their importance and hope over time uh, it, it uh, begins to make inroads. But it, this is a very tough problem for sure. Well, I think that's one of the things that Michael and I both agree on is the fact that your book really lays out a foundation for starting to think about solutions, which is really critical and really important, but also okay. the reason why you have to get the book because you have to read them all. And I don't want to give too many of them away, but I, I do want to say that there's a quote that you start this book with that I love so much that I've sent it to a whole bunch of people right now <laughs> already, and it is, uh, by Montesquieu, and it is constant experience shows us that every man invested with power is apt to abuse it and to carry his authority as far as it will go. To prevent this abuse, it is necessary from the very nature of things that power should be a check to power, which I think is profound and very, very powerful. So you do argue, you make a very strong argument for restraint in your book. I'm wondering what is the university's role? Well, I think universities in, a, in ideal terms serve an important restraint function of their own, actually. Um, so uh, as uh, at least historically understood, universities were the uh, spaces within which knowledge would be tended to. There would be, you know, university professors are custodians of knowledge and information, especially information that is risky or controversial or uh, speaks truth to power. In the, in the you know, architecture of a liberal democratic system, you want these type of safe spaces. You want to obviously be able to pass that knowledge on to future generations, but you also want to carve out an area within society to allow for controversial research, controversial opinions to be expressed by design. Uh, unfortunately, that you know, core mission of the university, which most university mission statements include, has actually been uh, declining in practice. Uh, and that's because of the intrusion of, of private sector funding and, and the kind of 
pressures that these create to be risk averse. And I've seen this in, in my own experiences where, you know, if you look at computer science, engineering science departments, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, most often they justify themselves in terms of job creation. You know, that's important. We, you know, but the university is not just, its existence isn't defined by being a place that people go through to then get a job, right? Like that, that is, if any, at best, I would say a secondary function. And I'm sorry, a lot of my other colleagues may not agree with me here. Call me a traditionalist. Um, I think that, you know, the methods in computer science and engineering science kind of saddens me because we have appropriated them at the citizen lab and, and have shown how powerful they can be to illuminate what's going on beneath the surface of the internet. And, and yet they're not used in, in such a manner within the computer science, engineering science departments on the whole. There are some exceptions, of course, but generally speaking, highly conservative departments because they're risk averse. They don't wanna you know, ruin a sponsorship for a chair, uh, funding for scholarships from Google, Apple, Microsoft, whatever. Um, you know, I recognize that that can be important in limited circumstances, but when it begins to threaten the independence of university research, then we have a big problem and we're losing sight of our core mission. Such an important point. And I also uh, put myself on mute because in these COVID pandemic days, um, my neighbors in the fall have started to activate their leaf blower. <laughs> so I must apologize because <laughs> it's the super time, loud. Times anyway, we live in. Yeah. I'm going to mute myself through uh, the rest of this uh, when I'm not speaking. We have another great question here, which is COVID-19 has reshuffled the deck around issues relating to cyberspace. And there's a dark side to connectivity, which you also suggest in your earlier book, Black Code. My question is, what are some of the policy options the Citizen Lab would recommend to the Government of Canada to protect against foreign surveillance on Canadians? Well, you know, that's a, again, a very, it's a big question and a big challenge because um, look, we live in a world right now where um, unfortunately to some degree, offense, you know, going on the offense, uh, undertaking hacking, uh, cyber espionage, a huge private sector that supports it. All of these now are amplifying internationally. It is the new normal. So, um, you know, you would think that governments would mostly be concerned about defending and, and they do spend some time on that uh, challenge. The problem is that is very difficult. So uh, everyone goes on the offense instead and our government is included. We have a, a well-equipped signals intelligence agency that has authority uh, to undertake foreign espionage abroad in, in ways that I believe and some of my colleagues believe is far too broadly defined. And the safeguards to prevent abuse of power, um, should it occur, uh, are pretty thin right now. Um, some progress has been made, but we think it could be much stronger. Um, to me, this is what Canada could do uh, to protect against that threat, is to set a better example, uh, to show that we can have a well-equipped military and even a well-equipped intelligence agency, but one that operates within a, a rule set that prevents against abuse of power and lead by demonstration. I think that's the only way to go. And then, you know, on the defensive side, we could do a lot more to ensure that uh, our, our, our information systems are safe or at least more secure than they are now to that type of threat. And one of the, the biggest bugaboos I have is around encryption. So clearly encryption is one of the best ways that we can ensure that the data that we rely on is authentic and is secure, safe from breaches, et cetera. It doesn't solve everything, but it's a very important pillar. And yet time and again, authorities and officials in Canada and other countries have argued for the deliberate weakening of encryption, inserting back doors in systems. So, you know, while we are demonstrating the opposite example that we should be internationally, we're also drilling uh, uh, holes in our critical infrastructure, um, kind of the digital equivalent of Swiss cheese. So this is like insecurity by design. It's, it's completely 
uh, contrary to how I believe our stance should be if we were intending to lead in this area. Speaking of contradictions, we have another question related to that that I think our friend, our mutual friend Corey Doctorow would probably want to chime in on too if he were around. Mm. Uh, Canada wants to save and reinvent its auto sector. In this sector, manufacturers and other players claim the right to own and control the data and that their products and users generate. How do we deal with that contradiction? Well, this speaks to, it's an excellent question and it speaks to a, a broader uh, pathology right now, which is around uh, property ownership in, in the digital age. As part of the dynamic of surveillance capitalism, and I describe a bit about this in the book, there's been this really fundamental transformation in, in property relationships that um, I think most people don't, uh, you know, people who, who, who are, are immersed in this environment have not fully grasped. So when we sign off on terms of service and the consent process, which most of us do not read, we're actually turning over our private information as the companies, as the platform's private property that they can then appropriate and use and monetize in ways that they see fit. So this is you know, a, a big pathology that cuts across the organization of, of of cyberspace as it's currently constituted around this business model. And um, when it comes to something like, you know, autonomous vehicles, which I think, you know, have many positive, potentially positive aspects to it, um, especially when it comes to safety and maybe sustainability as well, if we're talking about electric powered autonomous vehicles, we need, on the other hand, to be able to, and I say this literally, lift the hood on these systems, understand what the algorithms are doing, because obviously uh, these vehicles need to be networked. So they're going to be gathering a lot of data and then communicating it out as they move through the cities. Um, we need to have independent uh, organizations, whoever they may be, wherever they may come from, universities or elsewhere, maybe mandated by public authorities, uh, who have um, the ability to peer inside all of these powerful algorithms, not just res with respect to autom autonomous vehicles, I'd argue, but across the board uh, with everything uh, that is embedded in, in the Internet of Things world in which we live. There's another really great section on your book um, where you delve beyond uh, how you know, the body of the phone and the body, the physical body and how it's impacted. You also talk about how um, this new network and infrastructure and cell phones impact our minds. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, everything from the oxytocin. And... Yeah, sure. This is, uh, you know, not my own area of expertise, but it's one of those, uh, when I was writing this book, I wanted to synthesize a lot of other people's research and one that I've, I've begun to understand and talking to other people who research in this area is the um, enormous effort that is put into designing applications and devices to be as compelling as possible, frankly, as addictive as possible. The reason uh, that they do that is in order to capture and retain people's interests. Because if you're going to base your business around gathering as much information from as many sensors as you can, from users, uh, you need to make sure that users want to have those devices and applications around them at all times. And, and so once you begin to reflect on that and, and see it through that lens, it becomes impossible to uh, not see. Um, so I look at this device and uh, what I see is like a operant conditioning device. Um, you know, buzzers going off, app icons kind of jumping up and down. Yes, exactly. Um, and of course, then there's the content itself, the propulsion of sensational, extreme, emotional content that gets at our system one uh, cognition. In other words, our, our propensity to see things through our emotions. Um, all of that is very attractive to us in a way that is almost subconscious. And of course, it's very exciting uh, to think about, you know, what we may see. And hence, you, you want, especially in ways that for example, Twitter is designed where there is no end, right? You're just, you're constantly refreshing. So it sets up this expectation 
of an, a, a reward that is going to come. And when it comes partially or only in incomplete ways, it actually tempts you to look for more. Um, those are human traits, you know, that have been around for millennia that are being tapped into uh, by the companies. Now, I don't want to overstate it. I, I don't think we're blindly and obediently going around. Uh, I've had conversations with our friend Corey Doctorow about this. He's very skeptical about the powers of the platform's ability to persuade us about things. And I, I would agree with him, but underlying it, I think there is this basic addiction towards the devices and applications that I think is obvious. If you, if you walk down the street, you see people um, you know, connected to their devices or panicking when they forget where they left their phone, right? That, that shows you that these are highly compelling at a cognitive level. Absolutely. It's, it feels like you've lost part of your brain. Like you leave, you leave part of your brain at home when you don't take your phone out. Yeah. Um, somebody has just written in. And again, thank you for so many questions that have come in. I'm going to try to get to, through as many as I can in the limited time that we have left. Um, another one is, in addition to data ownership, could you talk about how the right to repair advocacy dovetails with your argument? Where do you see this headed in Canada? And what should you advise individuals to do? Again, that's an excellent question, a, a topic dear to my heart. Uh, I write about it uh, in relation to, um, you know, I was looking through an analogy around uh, historical periods where the idea of power being recessed in various ways, in other words, held in reserve is an important check, important safeguard against the abuse of power by centralized authorities. And I think what we have with respect to the right to repair is something analogous to that. So as it stands, perversely, at the very moment that we are surrounded by all of this technology, we're actually dissuaded, and I would go so far as to say forbidden from looking inside all of this stuff, right? The term, if I, if I open up this device right now and look into it, the term for that is called jailbreaking, which to me speaks volumes about uh, our, the culture uh, we have settled into around our relationship to all of this technology. Um, you know, most of the companies forbid you from trying to repair your own device for proprietary reasons or using the vehicles of proprietary law and copyright law um, in order to entrench their power over our lives. So we need to be able to get inside uh, these devices to exercise some control, some counterbalance, because once you start looking inside, then you discover, oh, wow, this is doing things I didn't realize it was doing. Uh, this shouldn't be happening, um, which is why I feel very strongly about the, the, um, the importance of techniques around reverse engineering, which we practice a lot at the Citizen Lab because you're effectively opening it up. Um, the right to repair would also help with planned obsolescence, which is part of the you know, not just an issue with mobile technologies, it's pervasive across consumer capitalism, leading to all sorts of waste. And it's not just the stuff we throw away, you know, the recycling process is uh, hugely taxing from an environmental perspective because it involves a lot of machinery and labor and pollutants, right? Um, so we need to restrain that. And I believe the right to repair is an entry point into it. Um, I, you know, in terms of what Canadians could do, I think we should push for legislation that guarantees the right to repair. It may not be successful, um, but if, if as many jurisdictions as possible push for it simultaneously, we could have a big win around it. Here, here. Um, another question. It seems like the solution is to demand democratic governments in the global liberal system to regulate surveillance internationally and locally. However, how can we realistically expect this when these same democracies and the liberal system has allowed for the proliferation of surveillance tech and technology through markets? Tricky question. <laughs> yeah, it's, I would even go further than the market point and, and say that their practices, uh, and I'll give you a, a quick story. So I spent many years, mostly in the early 2000s at global cybersecurity forums where um, organizers would convene stakeholders from government, private sector, civil society, academia to talk about, you know, rules of the road around what 
how states should behave in cyberspace. And many countries, Canada included, would advocate for these human rights principles. And I became very frustrated because while the what was on paper was uh, obviously laudable and something that I supported, it, I, I looked at what was going on in practice back home and noticed a complete contradiction. We were, Canada that is, essentially violating every one of these principles in practice, um, which is why I think when it comes to these topics, we need to begin at home. I mean, we, it's, it's very difficult to um, you know, confront uh, this huge tidal wave uh, coming from, say, China or other countries that have a differently constituted architecture, political architecture, um, one that I think would put human rights at risk if we don't have our own houses in order. We need to get our own houses in order first and then confront that challenge. And right now we're not. I'll take one last question from our viewers, and this one is related, you know, so often the questions come down to, you know, what should governments do, what should corporations do, and then of course, what can the individual do. Um, so the question here is, in some cities, surveillance cameras are the norm, they are where I live. There's a lot of support from the people here because they think cameras will keep them safe. You say we should work at the municipal level. What should we be asking our authorities about the handling or the storing of this information? Well, that excellent question. I'm glad you asked it. I, you know, there is a concrete path forward here. Recently, Citizen Lab uh, researchers produced a report uh, along with uh, researchers in the Faculty of Law on the use of artificial intelligence and predictive policing in Canada at a municipal level, as well as at a, a provincial and federal level, we have found that law enforcement are using a variety of techniques, including being able to tap into facial recognition systems, but doing it without proper warranting systems in place, safeguards in place to prevent uh, the abuse of, of the collection of that data. So we should simply ask our law enforcement uh, and demand, frankly, <clears throat> that they be more publicly accountable and act according to proper safeguards. You know, they have an important job to do. It's quite possible that some of these technologies will be beneficial to that job. Some maybe are so egregious we should ban them altogether. And I'm leaning in that direction uh, along with many others when it comes to the combination of AI and facial recognition technologies, which are inherently discriminatory um, and are connected to the, the furthering of racialized policing practices that we see in North America and elsewhere. Um, but we can demand that those practices change and make sure that we get to the right authorities at a municipal level, push them, advocate, elect people who understand these issues so that they can bring about a change. And we have seen great wins in that area, right? Boston, San Francisco, Portland, yes. now Maine. Um, so it's terrific to see that when people actually do band together, you can see these big changes being made. I have Absolutely. one time for one last question now. Uh, maybe if we could keep it to two minutes, just so that I can wrap as well. Um, Ron and I both actually work with Pen Canada, which is an organization that helps writers in peril. And as we've been talking about today, uh, there are algorithms that really shape what we read, they influence what we know, they form these bitter and hostile political bubbles that people tend to get trapped in. So what is your thought on restraint there? Biden has just announced maybe yesterday, the day before, that he's starting a new task force on online harassment, the connection with shootings and extremism. Um, do you think that this is something that we need here in Canada? What are your thoughts around that? For sure. There, there is a... Um a whole disturbing area around the use of surveillance technology in uh, stalking, spousal stalking, uh, mostly. Uh, of course, most of this is, you know, men using um, software that they purchase from these shady companies to um, download on, on their spouse's devices and use it to stalk them and harass them and, and frankly worse. Um, we did a report that I'd encourage the questionnaire to take a look at on this topic called in Installing Fear um, and the Predator in Your Pocket, uh, which is about the stalkerware industry. And we have detailed recommendations there about what could be done. 
I think that's the way to handle this broad issue is to be precise, look at areas where um, there is clear abuse and identify the policy mechanisms and the legal mechanisms that we could introduce to mitigate those harms. In, different in each circumstance, stalkerware, you wanna look at it a certain way. Maybe you need to pass specific laws related to that type of harm. Um, with broader spyware that's sold to intelligence agencies, it's yet a different solution set. And we may have to um, require the social media platforms to be more transparent and accountability accountable about preventing that type of harm from taking place over their platforms. Well, I think we're exactly at noon now and uh, my TV brain tells me that's exactly when we have to wrap. <laughs> I want to remind everybody though that uh, Ron is this year's 2020 Massey lecturer. His lectures began airing just last night. They're going to be all week long on CD, CBC Radio's Ideas with Nala Ayed and it's gonna be available on the CBC Listen app. What you heard today is just a very small taste of the many thoughtful, brilliant ideas that Ron has condensed into this book. Be sure to copy, pick up a copy of Reset. It's published by the House of Anansi Press. It's available in bookstores now. Independent bookstores are the ones that I think we both <laughs> prefer. Um, and of course, you know, we've talked so much today about the notion of opacity and digital technologies. And I promise you, if you read this book, things will become much, much clearer. Thank you, Ron, so very thank much. Thank you so much, Shia. It's really great to talk to you on this panel. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you.